welcome everyone um, to this uh, webinar uh, put on on behalf of uh, Parachute and CARS, a joint webinar on the Global Decade of Action 2021 to 2030, What You Need to Know. Um, wonderful to have you all. Uh, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, some of you may have attended a webinar that we jointly put on in November, giving you an introduction to the um, the Global Decade of Action. So today's presentation is to build on that, to just do a quick recap um, for those of you who might have missed that, uh, and then move on to some more specific tools that have recently become available, which is pretty exciting as we lead into um, uh, uh, Road Safety Week. So uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Valerie Smith, the uh, Director of Programs at Parachute, uh, for much of the presentation, but I'll kick us off um, and just give you a quick uh, recap. So um, let's just take a quick look at the outline for today. Yeah, so the quick um, overview, and then um, uh, you'll hear about the recent meetings that uh, took place that uh, that uh, Val and uh, a couple of other Canadians um, uh, were fortunate to attend, and uh, then some of the specific tools um, that came out of that uh, that meeting that are available really to all of us, which is why we're we're doing the sharing uh, session uh, today. Um, we'll close by talking uh, about how CARSP and Parachute are, are supporting the, the global decade, uh, which is important, and perhaps how we can all take part in it, and then talk specifically about um, Road Safety Week, um, which is uh, coming right up. So Parachute, the other uh, organization that you'll hear from today, is Canada's national charity dedicated to injury prevention. And Parachute's um, uh, vision uh, is a Canada free of serious injuries with Canadians living long lives to the fullest. So that's the Parachute organization. And uh, the CARSP organization is a very um, consistent uh, a vision, which is uh, essentially Vision Zero. By following Vision Zero principles, our vision in, in our research and practical approaches, our vision is to achieve zero deaths and serious injuries on Canada's roads. And CARSP's mission, I won't read the whole thing, but really it's about uh, multidisciplinary research, sharing uh, multidisciplinary research and evidence-based best practices, uh, as well as to support um, uh, the UN's uh, Decade of Action uh, and Road Safety Resolutions. So just quickly, this, uh, this graphic, uh, uh, kind of nicely summarizes the um, the plan, the global plan for the decade. And uh, it, it does it in a very visual way, as you can see here, trying to uh, answer three questions, what to do, how to do it, and who does it. Okay, the, the, the goal of the 50% reduction is, is shown at the top. Um, the, uh, at the far left, um, Julie, if you could maybe just point to Point to that, yep, yeah, is um, the uh, sort of the components of the uh, the safe system approach, and uh, some of you may be familiar with you know different iterations of this that you've seen. I, I wanted to point out the the one at the top that refers to multimodal uh, transportation and land use planning. Uh, there's been a lot more attention and recognition given to the importance of that as uh, as being critical to uh, improving road safety performance uh, by looking at uh, you know our land use and transportation as early as possible in the in in the life cycle to have an overall uh, greater uh, effect and uh, the others uh, include uh, uh, you know um, post crash care safe road users safe vehicles um, etc and uh, on the uh, underneath this sort of the arc there, uh, you see all of the different kind of programs or ingredients that are necessary um, and, 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 uh, as part of the safe system approach to reach our objectives, uh, including legislation, speed limits, uh, uh, sustainable financing, making use of technology uh, as a few examples. And then uh, towards the right, uh, um, it lists the key partners, who to do it. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's important that you know, as we all do our work, whether we're in government or non-government or in the private sector, is that we all support one another. 
because the all the research and best practices show that the more that we work together, the greater the results are going to be. A lot of us might have great things that we have in place just as government or just as NGO, but it, it can get even better if we involve each other. Uh, and of course, uh, having funding is a, is a necessary part of that, you know, making uh, making good use of the private sector, which may be interested in, and available, but sometimes isn't uh, as engaged as they could be. So uh, all those things are are important, getting everybody on board uh, uh, towards working towards the same objective so we can actually meet this uh, ambitious goal. Next. One thing I just wanted to, before I turn it over to Val, wanted to mention uh, that uh, CARSF has been taking the lead on is um, trying to see how we in Canada can support the decade of action, not only within Canada, which is an important uh, part and what we'll hear mostly about today, but also how can we assist other uh, parts of the world that are even in a much worse position uh, than we are in Canada. And, you know, the fact is we do have a lot of experts, including many of you that are on the uh, in the audience today, uh, who frankly have the capability uh, and and the um, and the tools to assist uh, lower and middle income countries and uh, we as as organizations trying to lead uh, this effort would like to provide that opportunity wherever uh, uh, possible for you to do so um, perhaps you are already involved in some capacities but if you're not and if you're interested then please do um, uh, stay tuned as we communicate more about this in the coming weeks and, and months. Um, but please also feel free to put your your email address in the chat if you are interested in exploring opportunities to uh, you know extend your uh, expertise to to help um, uh, those in some other countries, whether it's in Africa or Asia, uh, a, a place where you uh, have as part of your background or you feel connected to in some way. There really is an opportunity to to influence uh, uh, how they are. Uh, how they are doing, because uh, many of you are in these uh, sectors that are needed, such as policing, uh, emergency response. Uh, many of you are engineers or planners or analysts, communications experts or researchers, and all of those and more uh, are needed. So um, certainly, um, and thank you, I've already I've seen people start to put their names in the chat. Please uh, keep that up. It'd be wonderful to um, to have Canada play a bigger role in helping uh, lower and middle income countries. It's, it'll be something that we can really be, I think, proud of uh, of, of doing. Hopefully, um, have have that make a greater impact. So, so um, certainly we'll we'll um, we'll keep you posted uh, on uh, on that if we have more specific requests uh, about about that. And um, uh, in the meantime, we are we are also looking at, at organizations that may be needing our help so that we can match the expertise to the help that's needed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to 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 Valerie Smith of, of Parachute to to uh, take us through the rest of the webinar, starting with the eighth global meeting. Val. Thanks so much, Raheem. So Raheem, as you were chatting, um, I was just thinking about and I'll just take a moment to to just share. I was thinking about how much the road safety space has changed from when I started working in it 12 years ago, 12 plus years ago. Uh, back then it was really focused on individual behavior change and education efforts. Um, and while of course those components are still really important, it's amazing to think about how much our thinking uh, has opened up to really recognize the complexity of our systems and our, our road systems. Uh, so we've got infrastructure, we have enforcement, we, we're looking at uh, road design and mobility through equity lenses. Um, we've got all sorts of mobility options, of course, cycling and pedestrians, but we also have e-scooters and e-bikes. Uh, we need to think about people with mobility issues and accessibility challenges. Um, and then, of course, based on just what you shared, we've got this new layer around uh, intersections between road safety and the environment, uh, physical and mental health, uh, and sustainability. So uh, I think it's a really exciting uh, time for road safety. There's a lot of opportunity um, for us, not just to work within our road safety silo, but to uh, work with one another and work with folks outside our typical uh, road safety world. So um, and, and when we talk about the global plan and we talk about the global decade of action, 
if you haven't had a chance to really take a deep dive, um, it's really focused on some of those components. And there's lots of lots of layers and lots of um, analysis into how road safety intersects with, with some of those issues. Uh, so that being said, I'll kick it off. Um, I was lucky enough to get to attend the eighth global meeting of NGOs advocating for road safety and road victims. Uh, it was in San Salvador in March. Um, the theme was rethinking road safety for people and the planet. So again, just that title speaks to how much road safety uh, has changed in terms of how we think about it. Uh, there were 260 people plus registered for the meeting with representation from 65 countries. Uh, there were two Canadian colleagues who I met um, that uh, there could have been more, but uh, certainly Bella Dinzar from FIA and Turf were there, as well as Mavis, a uh, former uh, CARS colleague, board colleague. Um, it was organized by the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. I want to do a shout out. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Alliance is an international organization that provides support and capacity for uh, NGOs from all over the world. Um, they work really closely with the World Health Organization, as well as the United Nations, and they're truly an inspiring group of uh, people. They're doing really amazing work, and a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is... Um, comes directly from their efforts and from the work they've uh, done on the decade. Uh, so the global meeting focused on providing tools to NGOs to advocate for more accountability by our governments, as well as a big push for us to encourage implementation of evidence-informed interventions to reduce traffic deaths and injuries. So I'll just take a moment to emphasize uh, as, as our work in road safety uh, goes on and our efforts continue, uh, we, there's, a, there's a real push for us to keep coming back to what works, what do we know works, what does the data tell, what does the data tell us? Uh, and that was loud and clear at this meeting. Uh, the goals of the meeting were to bring together NGOs, uh, and I'll open that up to that this meeting was specifically for NGOs. Um, however, when we talk about uh, coming together and mobilizing, we're really talking about civil society. So that includes NGOs, researchers, public health, um, families who have lost loved ones, individual champions. Um, so going back to the goals, um, the Alliance brought us all together to talk about the Global Decade of Action, uh, as well as to revisit the call to action established by member countries in 2021. Um, and if anyone, uh, uh, Raheem and I presented at this on this in our November webinar, um, and I can share that document uh, with anyone who's interested, just put your, your name in the chat. Uh, it was also an opportunity to talk about the launch of the Accountability Toolkit, as well as an overview of the Global Road Safety Week that's coming up in May. Next slide, please. Um, role and commitment of NGOs. So again, I'm I'm branching this out to include civil society. Um, in this global plan and in this second decade of action, there's a very strong emphasis on the role of NGOs and civil society. And that's quite different than the first decade of action. Um, so a lot of what we learned at this meeting was how do we stand up um, and call, uh, have a call to action for not only the government, but for all of civil society to really take a stand on road safety. Um, there was also an emphasis on the need for us to work cohesively and in collaboration with one another so that we can have a stronger and more strategic voice. Um, a need for us to push um, the right that all road users have a right to safely use the road. Uh, and a big part and an overriding emphasis that we need to work positively to engage our governments to be accountable um, around the UN resolution and the Global Decade of Action for Road Safety. Um, there was a commitment by uh, the governments that signed on to this resolution that we would work very hard to reach a 50% reduction in injuries and fatalities by 2030. And so there's a need for us to continue to work with our governments um, to remind them that we did sign on to that resolution. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, Julie, my colleague and I behind the scenes here are going to attempt to do an interactive walkthrough of uh, what's in the toolkit. Um, but before we get there, Julie's gonna, gonna swap screens, but before we get there, um, I'll give you an overview. So the toolkit is a set of practical web-based tools that the Global Alliance has designed. Um, it's been designed to provide tangible steps for all NGOs to hold their governments accountable. And um, they've developed a bunch of different resources um, that we will walk through. Uh, Julie, before you start moving around this, um, the website, I'm just gonna walk through some of the, um, the overview of the tools. So the Alliance came up with what they call an accountability checklist. And the accountability checklist helps um, NGOs prioritize interventions, proven interventions, um, to reduce road deaths and injuries using priority interventions. Um, they help us to define what our government is currently doing using a government to-do list. They help us uh, with NGO talking points, which are excellent. Um, and the NGO talking points really consolidate research and case studies from around the world uh, to help us when we meet with and try to influence our policymakers. Um, the five, before we get going, the five priority interventions that they highlight as evidence-based are um, an emphasis on 30 kilometer an hour zones where people walk, cycle, live and play, lower speed limits where relevant, pedestrian infrastructure improvements, traffic calming, and motorcycle helmet law, which is associated with enforcement and promotion. And that's really um, focused on lower income countries. Okay, so Julie, let's just have a look at the screen. So currently right now we're at the toolkit home. So if you, uh, if you have a chance, you can go on and review it. The accountability toolkit here that Julie has on the screen, and Julie, if you can just scroll down a little bit. I, I do wanna preempt this with um, the fact that the toolkit was very much designed um, for countries who have a central government. So um, if, if you were to walk through and play around with what's in the accountability checklist, you would see that um, it's very focused on advocating with a central government. Whereas in Canada, we know we have varying levels of government. We have our provincial and territory. We have our municipal government and our federal government. So Parachute's working with CARSP and some other organizations to look at how we can use this toolkit uh, in a way that works with, with our governments. Okay, so if you have a look at priority interventions, Julie. So again, uh, with each of the priority interventions, so starting with the 30 kilometer an hour, if we click on to NGO talking points, what we find here is a six to seven page summary of everything uh, someone might wanna know um, about why we want to reduce speed to 30 kilometers an hour in certain uh, areas, uh, especially high, uh, densely populated residential areas. So there's a lot of great information here. There's a lot of very uh, easy to articulate points that people can use in presentations, they can use if they're talking to their council. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's just very user-friendly. It's got infographics and um, it also provides a lot of great references. So if you wanna take a deeper dive, you can. Okay, let's have another look, Julie, at one of the other um, points. So let's go down to uh, let's go down to pedestrian facilities. Okay, so here they actually provide some evidence-based interventions uh, that you can speak to. They define them. Of course, again, this is high level. It's not all encompassing. Uh, there there may be interventions here. Um, that you may not want to focus on. There may be interventions here missing that you do want to focus on. But again, it provides, um, it provides you with the preliminary points you might need if you're talking to someone who you want to influence 
around some of the metrics in the global plan. Okay, let's go back to the Alliance homepage. And if you click on um, build your kit, Julie, what we'll find here is um, it, it's an opportunity for organizations to customize their own toolkit. Um, I would say this component of the toolkit is mostly relevant for uh, people working at a grassroots level who want to uh, influence and engage with their municipal government. Um, and I say that because um, it, it's, as I said, given that we have different levels of government, um, in order to really use this toolkit and use the accountability checklist to work with our provincial and territorial governments, as well as our federal governments, um, I think we have to build some consensus amongst civil society, uh, NGOs, and other organizations on how we can do this collaboratively. And I'm gonna talk about that briefly when I talk about next steps. So um, as I said, there's a lot of really great information here and I would encourage you to have a look at it. Um, they are in the draft stage still. So uh, they are looking for feedback on how, uh, how it works, how different countries and different folks using it in different countries uh, feel it could be improved. Um, so please reach out to us at Parachute or at CARSP if you have direct feedback and we can provide it to the Global Alliance. Okay, so um, Julie, next, if we can move on to um, the Global Road Safety Week, I can speak about uh, some of the resources that uh, the Alliance has put together for the Global Road Safety Week. So while Julie's pulling, um, pulling that up on the website, I'll just give an overview. Uh, the Global Road Safety Week is a global road safety campaign hosted by the World Health Organization. It brings together individuals, governments, NGOs, corporations um, from around the world to raise awareness on road safety and to help make changes that will reduce uh, injuries and road deaths. Uh, the seventh UN Global Road Safety Week this year will be held May 15th to the 21st. So it's coming up very quickly. Um, it is a call for policymakers to rethink mobility in order to make walking, cycling, uh, public transport safe and convenient so that people can use um, and make the shift to active and sustainable mobility. Um, and the modal shift, as I said earlier, is one of the big recommendations in the global plan for the decade of action. Okay, so um, on this portion of their website, you can find uh, key messages. So if you click on the key messages, Julie. So, um, what what they've uh, what they've done here is they've put together key messaging that all of their countries can use. Um, so depending on what lens you're wearing and whether you're an activist, whether you're a cycling enthusiast, uh, enthusiast, an NGO worker, um, you may come at these messages from a different perspective. Uh, but the key point is that uh, we do want to uh, work positively with our governments to. Um, around the metrics and the plans laid out in the Global Decade of Action. And we want to and keep encouraging that shift around rethinking mobility, rethinking equity, rethinking healthy and, city, healthy and sustainable cities. Um, if you scroll a little bit further down, um, we're going we're gonna to miss the, we're going to move past the advocacy opportunities because I did go through that already with the accountability toolkit. Uh, here are some activities the Alliance puts together um, for what you can do as an organization, whether you're working uh, as an NGO, whether you're working um, as a um, individual champion in your neighborhood or as a public health unit. Um, so these are just ideas and examples of what folks in other countries are doing, organizing initiatives like car free days in certain areas where um, they work with the police, they work with the municipality to uh, close down portions of the road and just encourage um, car-free mobility. 
Uh, they talk about decision maker uh, policy initiatives where you can work with your uh, local policymakers on um, uh, encouraging them to walk the talk around uh, some of the pieces that we signed on to for the UN resolution. Uh, Pop-up infrastructure is a little bit further down. Uh, 880 Cities is an amazing organization that does a lot of really great work around uh, pop-up infrastructures and various other initiatives. I'd encourage you to have a look at their website if you're interested in doing anything around, um, around pop-ups. Um, Julie, if you can continue to scroll right down. So again, more ideas on what you can do. Uh, some simple ideas, some more complex ideas. I know we know a number of areas that are doing cycling workshops, um, that are doing uh, initiatives with schools um, and within their cities uh, to, to uh, raise awareness on the Global Decade of Action. So this section of the website is very helpful. It's uh, prepackaged. Uh, turnkey resources that any organizations can use to take part in the um, global week. Uh, the social media banners um, offer all sorts of different options for um, mobility. Um, when you're speaking about mobility, um, the signboards and banners. Julie, if we can click on to a few of those just to show the audience. So it's a little slow to load. These are stencils that um, we used when we were in San Salvador and about a uh, hundred of us went out onto the streets and, and you can uh, use a temporary spray paint um, to, um, to put your stencils down and then to mobilize with photos around it and use those uh, during media opportunities or other, other initiatives you're running. They have, I think, about five different stencils you can use, um, and they, they make for uh, very good visuals. And just backing up one page. And then as you can see in the middle of the screen there, um, there's different signboards you can use to encourage walking, cycling, and public transport. They also have customizable materials there um, where you can pull different graphics um, and different messaging and build out your own presentation. So the Alliance is encouraging everyone to, that's taking part in the week to uh, mobilize together with photos and videos and share them to the Global Alliance. Um, we'd be happy to see you share it with Parachute and CARSP as well, because we are going to be also taking part in the week and doing uh, a lot of our own social media uh, during the week. There will be a Rethink Mobility Twitter storm happening on Wednesday at two o'clock. Um, and essentially that's when we, we get as many people uh, together um, to take part in a Twitter discussion around Rethink Mobility. Uh, we just, we try to take over Twitter with, with the hashtag uh, Rethink Mobility to raise awareness on the week. So yeah, so lots of really great resources here. Um, and uh, this, this is also on the Parachute website uh, and the CARSP website, um, links to, to the Alliance and to a number of the activities and to these graphics. So anyone, if anyone wants more information, if anyone has ideas on how they'd like to take part and work with, uh, work with us, then please reach out. Again, you can leave your name in the chat. You can email me. Uh, directly or or Raheem at Carsp and Parachute. Okay, so just going back to our presentation, um, I'm going to finish off um, talking about what Parachute and Carsp uh, are currently doing around the global decade and how organizations can get involved beyond taking part in that global campaign. Um, so when I talk about what uh, what we're doing, I often talk about parachute and CARSP together. Um, and I do that because uh, over the last few years, we've worked really hard uh, to collaborate with each other and to share uh, wherever possible 
um, information, resources, networks, and uh, work together on uh, various campaigns. Uh, it, it's not just CARSP and Parachute. We work closely with a number of other national organizations like TAC, uh, TERF, ITE, um, uh, CCMTA, and a number of, of groups. So uh, we're going to continue to engage with federal, provincial, and municipal governments uh, on the global plan, um, as well as in collaboration with other stakeholders. Previously, we sent out letters to all levels of government, including um, all mayors in um, a number of provinces that we work in. Um, we've been working very hard on engaging with municipalities um, around the country, um, mainly through our injury prevention partners in each province and territory. We will be issuing uh, letters to, um, to all levels of government uh, in the next two weeks. And we hope to do that in collaboration with CARSP and other stakeholders. And essentially, we'll be asking them uh, to meet with us uh, so we can discuss um, what's happening around the Global Decade of Action. And we can ask for an update on, on what uh, different levels of government are doing to participate in the Global Decade uh, and implement the plan. Uh, we're really excited to talk about a national coalition that uh, Parachute is hoping to uh, co-lead with CARSP. We're still in discussions with CARSP. Um, and essentially what, what we're hoping to do is bring together um, national organizations as well as uh, organizations coming out of provincial and territorial levels, um, individual champions and others uh, to talk about how we can build some consensus on the global plan and how we can mobilize together to push forward um, an agenda on ensuring that we are doing our very best to reach uh, the metrics set out in the Global Decade of Action. Uh, we, we are in the early stages of considering what the coalition looks like, um, but we will be sharing information probably uh, by late May to early June on what the coalition will look like, and um, we will be asking groups to participate. So stay tuned on that, but it's really about uh, building consensus and working together so we can be one voice and the global plan and the global decade of action for road safety will uh, sit at the center of that coalition. Uh, we're also going to continue to support all of our UN and global partner campaigns on the global plan, such as the one we just spoke of at Re about Rethink Mobility. Next slide, please. And of course, Parachute and CARSP um, and lots of other organizations um, that are probably on this call today, uh, public health folks, planners, municipalities, uh, researchers are all working together still to continue to um, advocate and uh, encourage uh, municipalities to adopt Vision Zero uh, and safe systems approaches. Um, and Parachute continues to highlight uh, mun municipalities and jurisdictions that are doing so. Uh, we have our Canadian landscape on Vision Zero 3.0 that uh, took a deep dive looking at who's doing what, what's working and what's not, and uh, it highlights 26 different jurisdictions in Canada doing Vision Zero. We're also going to continue doing our Vision Zero public awareness campaigns and uh, hopefully lots more events like this, webinars, conferences and getting out there and um, just continuing to learn from one another and share information on uh, evidence-informed practices uh, such as Vision Zero. Next slide, please. So uh, this, uh, these are just some photos I took um, during the global decade, or so, sorry, during the global meeting in San Salvador. Um, I met so many amazing people at this event. Uh, there were actually a lot of folks participating um, who had lost friends and family. Uh, and they had started uh, their own NGOs in their countries. So South Africa, India, Argentina. Um, I could probably name 10, 12 other countries uh, where these groups were started by, by people who had lost uh, primarily their their children or, or loved ones um, and or loved ones 
in collisions. So I was inspired every day I was there and I came back really energized and excited about um, really, you know, working together in Canada to, to make some changes. Uh, and you can see in that picture where they use the stencil um, as well as all the graphics. Next slide, please. Um, and then I asked, um, we, we added these slides on so you can see some of the work Parachute has done just recently. Uh, we produced some infographics with input from a number of stakeholders uh, that really speak about the intersections between road safety, um, equity, road safety and health and well-being, as well as the environment. And again, that's coming back to those intersections that uh, may not be super clear when we first think about road safety, but as we start to learn more and start to um, start to have a, a closer look uh, at all the different components we need to work on to make our roads safer, we really start to see how they intersect with um, things like climate change and uh, healthy cities, green spaces, uh, our mental health, physical health, um, and of course, equity at so many different levels. So uh, these infographics are on our website and uh, many of you on this call, I had a quick look at our participants. Many of you on our call took part uh, in helping us with these infographics. And um, if, if anyone has questions about them or uh, would like to access them, then please let us know. So um, that leads us to the end of our presentation and um, I will have a look in the Q&A. Um, Julie, I'll just, do you want to do the Q&A or do you want me to, to go ahead and do them? Uh, yeah, I can go through them. So let's just see here. I, I just uh, wanted to say, I, I did uh, attempt to answer some of them live, uh, okay. but those who asked if the answers are not satisfactory to you, please, uh, put them in the chat again. Okay, a lot of people are asking to have the presentation, the no November presentation shared, so we can definitely do that. And Julie, I'm just looking at the chat as well, and I'm looking at, uh, thank you everyone for sharing comments. Um, and, and yes, um, I see a comment here from Lynn Phillips. Um, they write, I'm calling in from the traditional territories of WSANEC people, saltwater people, specifically the stolen lands of the Tarstip Nation. Um, I'm curious how much State Global Meeting touched on safe system transportation equity, specifically regarding Indigenous rural and remote communities and the lack of safe sy systems protection in such communities. Um, so that's an excellent comment. There were, um, there were a number of sessions on equity, and because there was representation from 65 countries, um, various presenters did touch on marginalized communities within their own countries, including Indigenous populations. Uh, I was at, uh, I had discussions with um, some of the folks from Argentina, um, from India, from South Africa, where they did specifically speak about Indigenous groups. Uh, that being said, uh, in Canada, there's certainly a lot more we can be doing um, in terms of working with our Indigenous colleagues, and um, I would be happy to talk offline with you, Lynn, um, about how we can support the, the work you're doing and how we can do a better job at Parachute in terms of touching on um, collaboration with Indigenous rural and remote communities. Uh, Raheem, I'm not sure if you have anything to, to add there. Um, no, other than the general comment that uh, I know of, both, both of our organizations, Carsman Parachute and other partner organizations are looking at the issue more closely than ever before, as is necessary based on the data. So hopefully there'll be a lot more movement on, on this area in the coming months and, and years. But it's a, it's a it's an ongoing journey and, and struggle uh, that we need to make better progress on. Yeah, and if there's anyone on the call that is doing any specific initiatives or has information to share, 
uh, please drop it in the chat and then we can uh, circulate that as well. I'm also looking at another comment from Peter Burns, uh, who comments, not a very systems approach. It's mostly focused on infrastructure safety treatments. Um, and yeah, that's actually a good, um, a good observation. Uh, a lot of what we see in the accountability toolkit is focused on uh, what are evidence informed approaches. And certainly, uh, as we know, in the Vision Zero approach, that is not just built environment, uh, infrastructure and built environment plays a significant role in changing the way we uh, design and use our roads. Uh, but we also know that equity is very important, education is important, um, evaluation, uh, engineering, and enforcement, of course. Um, all of those pieces have to work together, and uh, they all deserve a, a equal portion of the, of the pie, and, and that's what a systems approach is. So um, if, Peter, if you want to contact me with a, a further uh, analysis of the accountability resources, I would be very happy to share it with the Alliance. And then um, Raheem, you, you made a comment to, to Peter uh, regarding the uh, infrastructure. Do you want to share just some of that content in case people haven't read the chat? Uh, well, I think it reinforces what you just uh, said, Val. Is that is that there there is indeed more emphasis on those um, uh, interventions that are more proven to succeed, uh, and it, it's of course easier to evaluate physical changes than things like human behavior changes or or other uh, you know kind of less infrastructure based uh, um, uh, types of interventions. And I think that that is partly the reason for that emphasis. But it's not intended to exclude those other factors. And as Val had implied, uh, even the, those physical interventions can be more effective when accompanied by the necessary, uh, you know, whether it's uh, changes to the law uh, or public education about how to use those facilities and then enforcement of, of whatever the best use of the or safest use of the infrastructure is. Okay. And I think there was one more question uh, from Joanne Valdmill. Do you have low literacy road safety resources like Parachute did with childhood injuries? That's a good question. I don't believe we do. Um, when we did the, uh, the low literacy road uh, resources for the childhood injury, uh, prevention initiative, we, we did have very specific funding and that allowed us to work with a number of different uh, demographics uh, in a number of different languages. And um, it was a, a very large initiative. Um, so I don't believe we have that for road safety resources, although some folks on the call might have access to that. And um, if, you, if you reach out again to us after this call, um, we'd be happy to to have a conversation with you and see how we can uh, support any any of your work you're doing with different uh, demographics from different literacy levels. So I think that's it. I don't see any more questions in the box. Um, and I would I would just let everyone know like to let everyone know that you will receive a evaluation. Um, link after this webinar is over and we would love if you could just take a minute or two uh, to to fill that out and uh, again uh, Raheem and I are available if anyone is interested in uh, engaging on the global plan and the global decade of action for road safety and we haven't reached out to you already then uh, please please get in touch with us and uh, we can keep you in the loop as we move forward with our plans. And I think that that's everything. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks Raheem. And uh, thank you, Julie. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.